So we are very happy to welcome Andreas Antonopoulos to Norway, and uh, we're very proud to have you here at Norway Bitcoin and Blockchain Association. Uh, a short introduction to our guest, Andreas Antonopoulos is a very well-known and respected person in the global Bitcoin and blockchain community. He is an engaged guru, uh, entrepreneur, teacher and speaker who travels the world around to spread the knowledge about Bitcoin and blockchain technologies. Welcome to Norway, Andreas. Oh, thank you so much. So we have gathered some questions from our members, but also from our friends in Sweden, from the Swedish Bitcoin Association. Uh, so the first question is, how can we better spread the knowledge about Bitcoin and blockchain technology, technology uh, around uh, young people like 15 to 25 years old? Well, I think um, young people naturally are attracted to the idea of technologies that operate on the internet that share the characteristics of the internet that are open, innovative, fast, cheap, and secure. And um, I think in the long run, when young people are exposed to banking as business as usual, they will find it um, bizarre uh, in yeah. that is slow and yeah. <laughs> controlled and expensive. Uh, I don't really think you need to promote the concepts to young people, although when it comes to understanding where Bitcoin has value in Scandinavian countries, right. I think uh, some of the arguments that work in other countries don't really work here. Um, in most countries, uh, governments are corrupt. Uh, governments uh, tend to concentrate power. The banking system is not particularly consumer friendly. In some cases, it's downright criminal. Yeah. Um, and those are not problems you really have in Scandinavian countries. So not that much. No. Yes, if you if you start with a premise that um, a government's government is benevolent, mm -hmm. um, then some of the traditional approaches to explaining Bitcoin to people I don't think are very useful. Instead, yeah. I think really talking about the powerful nature of Bitcoin's flexibility and programmability as a source of innovation. Right. Uh, the possibility of uh, taking some of the same kind of flexibility and transparency that you appreciate in Scandinavian countries, the egalitarian ethos, the transparent operation of government, and using this technology, pushing it into other countries right. and making it available internationally. So the idea is not let's fix Norway's banking or let's fix Norway's government, but it's more doesn't the whole world deserve the same level of government and banking as Norway has? For example, I think that's a much better way to explain why Bitcoin can do this uh, in countries where you don't necessarily have those capabilities. Right, right. And the globality that you can transfer money globally. Mm -hmm. uh, we had example here that young people here can use uh, VIPs very yes. easily. But it's only internal in the country. Well, VIPs is great. So, if yeah, it's great. If you're 15 That's years old or yeah. older, if you have a bank account, yeah, and if you have a credit card, and you don't have any transactions abroad, right? And if you only want to use it inside the country, yeah, then it's great. <laughs> Imagine if you could do VIPs only it was available to anyone of any age, hmm. any nationality, in yeah. any country, uh, without a bank account or a credit card. Well, that's Bitcoin. That's Bitcoin. Right there. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's great. Let's give it to the rest of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, next question is, uh, one of the first reactions that we get from people, especially technicians and programmers, when we are introducing them to Bitcoin is, uh, this will never scale. We can, we can impossible store all transactions in one database. Mm -hmm. How can we explain easily for them how this actually is working. Mm. Well, th they're correct. It, yeah. <laughs> um, we can never scale. Um, and in fact, if you look at early iterations of the internet, mm -hmm. right, the routing infrastructure then couldn't scale either. Mm -hmm. And so uh, over time, what you saw is the proliferation of additional layers in the network. Now, one of the nice mm -hmm. things about um, especially payments, which is the aspect of, of this technology that we need to scale the most, 
is that you can create um, systems where you batch payments, where you group them together, mm -hmm. and you only communicate the difference um, right. in large batches of data. We already have examples of that technology in Lightning Network, right. Tumblebit, uh, Moonbeam, and certain other second layer technologies that are being implemented in Bitcoin, as well as uh, Raiden in Ethereum and mm -hmm. other platforms like that. Um, they allow you to actually take the payments network to the scale of millions or even billions of payments per second. Uh, so far exceeding any level we have in any financial network today. Exceeding Visa and, and MasterCard. By orders of magnitude. By orders, by of, orders magnitude. of magnitude. So you can really bring forward this vision of, of micropayments. But the trick is doing that mm. without putting trust in any central party. Right. Uh, yeah. Being able to communicate between two parties without them trusting each other. Mm -hmm. um, and without centralizing the network by giving too much power to any one party. Right. We can preserve those characteristics. So the real question about Bitcoin is not whether you can scale payments, uh, but how do you scale trust so that you right. can scale payments? Because one easy way to scale payments mm -hmm. is to not scale the trust system right, right. and centralize Just it. Just have one central server. The easy answer is the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. The harder question is, how do you scale Bitcoin while preserving the trust model exactly as it is? Right. And there are answers to that. It's an engineering problem. And um, I think as we've reached a point where there's some pressure on the scale of Bitcoin, it's created this explosion of innovation, um, which is leading us to not just one solution, but many, many, many layers of solutions that can all be expressed over time. Right, right. So doesn't we have, a, if we are using Lightning Network, isn't that a way of centralizing that we must have some, the payment channel? Isn't that a centralizing technology or how? Well, how not necessarily. Um, I can run a hub, you can run a hub, mm -hmm. everyone in Bitcoin can run a hub. There's no um, inherently centralizing part to the architecture. Now, granted, because in order to use Lightning Network, mm -hmm. you have to commit funds and those funds generate fees, it can have a centralizing effect. Um, but here's the thing. We're not making a choice between Lightning Network and doing everything on chain. That's not the no, choice we right, have. Right. We're making a choice between doing things in a trustless off-chain payment channel like Lightning Network, yes. or doing things in a trusted off-chain database that belongs to a company like Coinbase yes. or some other provider. Yeah. Yeah. Um, those are the choices, and already more than 80% of Bitcoin transactions are happening off-chain in the private databases of service providers. So we actually achieve less centralization by moving to a trustless system like that. Right, okay. Uh, the interest for blockchain technology has figuratively exploded in the last 12 months, mm -hmm. especially outside the financial sector. Mm -hmm. So we see IBM, we see SAP, uh, Microsoft, Mm -hmm. are now promoting and marketing their solutions rather uh, aggressively. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts about uh, Hyperledger and uh, the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance? I mean, uh, I think overall this is good because what it's yeah. doing is it's mm -hmm. training a lot of developers exactly. in yes. the concepts and eventually they discover mm -hmm the real open and public blockchains that are going to have a huge impact in the exactly. world. Yeah. Um, about a month ago I was in Singapore and I met this person who told me, um, I've been working in the blockchain space for a year and I just discovered Bitcoin <laughs> and now I'm very excited. And it blew my mind. Even mm -hmm. though I had predicted this would happen, yeah. I hadn't seen an example of it yet. This person had gone to a seminar organized by a bank that spent an hour teaching them about blockchain yeah. without using the word Bitcoin, yeah. which just shows, you know, kind of the soulless search for profit can cover any sense of rationality or ethics whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's like going to, um, in the early 19th century, um, uh, a seminar about new possibilities for vehicles mm -hmm. and uh, doing an hour seminar on tires and not mentioning automobiles, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And right. selling that right. to horse manufacturers, 
or yeah. horse breeders. It's <laughs> it's insane. But at the same time, that's what's happening. There's a there's a very big effort to create all of this marketing hype. Yes. Yeah. The truth is that while blockchain technology is, if implemented correctly, a very interesting technology, mm -hmm. it has some narrow applications. You do not need a trusted, immutable, neutral, censorship-resistant platform for everything. Right. Um, the capabilities that it offers come with disadvantages. Transparency is not always an advantage, so, which is why, for example, I don't think there's a very good use case for healthcare. Um, especially not private health information. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't scale as well as a replicated relational database. There's a tendency to try to apply blockchain to everything where a replicated relational database would work, and that's unnecessary. Yeah. Um, but it's generating enormous hype at the moment, an enormous investment. You know what? All of this investment, most of it's going to fail. That's the truth in any startup. Mm -hmm. In the end, the market is going to select the things that really work and discard the things that don't. Um, all of these big companies, they're trying to find a way to inject innovation into their product line yep. and generate more revenue from their enterprise clients. That's fine. I find most of it boring. It's not bad. It's not good. It's just simply boring. It's um, boring yeah. The really interesting applications applications that are so truly destructive and so truly outside of the norm of what we do today with the internet mm -hmm. um, that if you try to present them to an investor or a regulator or a government agency yeah. they're horrified yeah so that's, that's a good it. test if what you're trying to do horrifies investors yeah that's probably just about disruptive that's enough good, to good be test. a meaningful application yeah. Um, and if there's smiles all around in a conservative board of investors, mm. guess what? It's not disruptive. No, not really. um, I'm interested in the really disruptive applications, and most of what's coming out of the blockchain space isn't. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. Yeah. Um, mm. If you look at what happened, for example, in the internet up to the year 2000, mm -hmm. we saw a lot of failed ideas and a lot of grand vision. Absolutely. And 95% of that got wiped out at the end of the bubble. Mm -hmm. But the internet persisted, mm -hmm. and many of those ideas came back better at a better time yeah. and became hugely successful, and in the end, society was transformed. Um, I, I think all of that's great. It doesn't really change what uh, Bitcoin is going to do. It doesn't change what Ethereum is going to do. Ironically, I think things like the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance are these alliances of convenience that we saw in the early days of Bitcoin. A lot of companies were interested in Bitcoin, um, but then they started shying away from the reputation of, of Bitcoin. Mm, things like the Silk Road and things like that um, caused people to start worrying about associating their brand with Bitcoin. Well, it's ironic to think that Ethereum is a platform for running unstoppable code. Mm -hmm. And eventually someone's going to write the actual marketplace like Silk Road in Ethereum code. Right. So then it will not only be yeah. providing the funds as Bitcoin was for Silk Road, it will actually right. be running the market yeah. on the platform. At that point, you're going to see the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance start distancing themselves from Ethereum. And they're going to say, well, we're not so interested in Ethereum. But the technology behind <laughs> Ethereum, smart contracts. Have you heard that right, before? I've heard that before. Right. So it's going to be the same story all over again. In, Probably, in fact, yes. if that happens, that means Ethereum is doing something interesting. Doing if something it's too good, yeah. comfortable yeah. for an enterprise alliance, uh, then it's not doing anything disruptive. Uh, business yeah. as usual, we already have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these platforms are all about changing business as usual. At least that's my opinion. Exactly. It is. Yes, yes. Uh, talking about Ethereum, then Ethereum is planning to switch over to a proof of stake algorithm. Uh, can a proof of stake uh, actually be as safe as a proof of work? No idea. <laughs> um, there's only one way to find out. Yeah. And that's for someone to do it at scale. So I'm right. glad Ethereum is doing it yeah. because it's going to allow us as an ecosystem. You know, I, right, yeah. I've, I've never taken a maximalist position in this space. I see this as a big ecosystem full of experimentation. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin has its role. It provides the role of robust money 
sound money, long-term store of value, and it's almost a gateway to a lot of the other things that happen. It's also a, a test for what happens at the $20 billion scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The good thing about Ethereum right now is that it's not at the $20 billion scale. And actually that mm -hmm. allows it to have more room for experimentation. Um, because of that, I think it's a great test bed to test this uh, proof of stake system. There may be room for only one proof of work algorithm in the world. Proof of work is expensive. What it yeah. gives you is immutability of um, a certain quality. It's immutability that is backed by energy. And that's right. a very expensive way yeah. to do immutability. Yeah. There's a very good argument to be made that you can run proof of stake systems that are anchored mm -hmm. into Bitcoin's chain mm -hmm. to sort of inherit some of that expensive immutability without having to do it themselves. Right. Uh, and I think we might have an opportunity to see that. Not that Casper is planning on doing that, um, but it might be an interesting option for the future as well. Casper is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very well-designed system, and I think it will allow us to test proof of stake at a much greater scale. It won't be without problems. Proof of work has problems, and mm -hmm. at each scale, we uncover new problems. Um, because greater scale means greater level of attack mm -hmm. um, and also a greater challenge. And so proof of stake will have to start small and then mm -hmm. gradually build up in value. Right. Security is not something that is simply an on or off. You can't say something is is or is not secure. It's not a true false statement. It's either or. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not either or. It's a quantitative issue. So the question is how secure? And the answer for proof of work is 21 billion. Right. That's how secure proof yeah. of work yeah. is. Why? Because we have $21 billion parked in a proof of work yeah. system yeah. and it has not yet been brought down. So how secure is proof of stake? Right now, it's about as secure as there are some proof of stake systems running. They're mm. in the millions, right? Mm. right? If Ethereum does it, we may be able to make a statement like proof of stake is $4 billion, $5 mm -hmm. billion secure. Right. As big as the market cap. Right, that cryptocurrency. Yeah. Because that much money is kept protected by right. it. Right. And so that will allow us to quantitatively assess the security of proof of stake. Mm -hmm. And as both of these systems escalate, we can keep proving them at higher and higher levels. And they will be more and more challenged at each level. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope to see more consensus algorithms. There's no reason to only have one. No. Um, no. And I think part of this experimentation is that each choice that is made that's different. Um, sends that system down a different path mm -hmm. where it can differentiate, but also create unique applications. I think proof of stake is much better suited to Ethereum's style of governance, as well as to its much more experimental and much more rapidly changing, more flexible nature, which is what you need for highly programmable smart contracts. Right. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make it very suitable for robust sound money, um, but Bitcoin already does that. There's no need to repeat it. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is how I see it as each system is beginning to fit more closely into an environmental niche mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it can dominate. Right, right. Great. Uh, moving on to uh, patents. Mm -hmm. uh, Craig Stephen Wright and his associates, associates has launched more than 70 patent applications for mm -hmm. Bitcoin. Uh, Blockstream has announced a, a defensive patent strategy. Mm -hmm. And now we had ASIC Boost patents from, from uh, Bitmain. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the most famous of them all, maybe, is the Accenture editable blockchain patent. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion about patents in, in the whole Bitcoin blockchain and ecosystem? Well, about three years ago, I started uh, actively talking about the risk that patents have in the space. Mm -hmm. And they can significantly slow down innovation, yeah. especially in the commercial side. Yeah. They don't affect Bitcoin because Bitcoin no. is open source <clears throat> and um, you can't stop open source software from implementing patents. There, there is no one to sue for patent infringement in, in open source. Right. Um, and so I, I don't think that's really an issue for 
the software itself. Mm -hmm. But it can be a very challenging mm -hmm. issue for the companies that work in the right. Bitcoin space. Right. Um, in, in some of the roundtables uh, I've participated that had several members of the industry um, discussing patent strategy, the general attitude was patents are necessary for commercial use mm -hmm. as a defensive thing, but we should as an industry work hard to avoid them being abused as an offensive strategy. Meaning that companies do need to patent their own innovation to make sure that nobody else can grab it and then exclude them from the thing they invented. Right. Especially in the US, we have a big problem because the patent law was changed, mm -hmm. uh, really in favor of very large, well-funded corporations. Right. So that patents are no longer based on first to invent, but they're based on first to patent. Meaning that mm -hmm. even if you invented it before, yeah. if you didn't patent it, you lose. And you right. can be excluded right. from using your own invention. Um, this creates a, an incentive for very well-funded organizations to take out patents, even on things they didn't invent. Right. And it incents mm. patent trolling. Right. Um, mm. The kind of thing that Blockstream has done with the defensive patent uh, policy, I think, is very positive for the mm. industry. Mm. Uh, they're not the only ones. In no. fact, I think some of the others have made similar inventors pledges or um, uh, defensive patent pledges. Pledges are not perfect. They do not survive the bankruptcy of an organization. One of the risks in this space is that when a company that has a lot of patents goes bankrupt and those patents are sold, they're bought by commercial patent exploitation yeah. trolls, trolls who yeah. then use it to attack the rest of the industry with extortion. Right. Yeah. Um, and that can be very costly. So yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a challenge uh, in the industry. It won't stop, it will stop the, uh, innovation among commercial companies. Mm -hmm. uh, right. It won't stop the innovation in the open source community. And of course, that's one of the advantages of open source, yeah. is right. that it's not encumbered by this. It's sad. Patents originally were designed as a means to protect inventors. Um, they've right. been perverted over right. decades and decades. And so now so. they are simply a form of corporate welfare, yeah. um, just like many other forms of corporate welfare. They are, yeah, yeah. I heard a number, uh, we had a patent discussion on the Oslo Blockchain Day uh, the other day, and uh, I heard that 90% of all patents are actually not used. They are just have stored as a, as a security if someone else should, should infringe of your, on your patents, right. no, the, then the, you can use your Yeah, the primary assured, patents, so. the pri primary, um, Sorry, the primary used uh, mechanism or policy for these is mutually assured destruction. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. is, if you sue me, I'll yeah. sue you back with a hundred more. Yeah. It takes patents. a lot of uh, energy and capital away from actual developing and actual right. good, good stuff. So. Okay, moving on to more uh, so society and government questions. Uh, what is your opinion about separation between government and economics in general? And what part can uh, blockchain play in a perfect economical social order? So I think uh, in, in, most, uh, in most of the developed world, it is firmly understood that there are very, very good reasons why um, church and state should be separate. Yeah. Um, but that's a new invention. Rather new, yeah. Uh, yeah. For a very long yeah. period of history, church and state were not separate, and right. that had very bad outcomes for everybody. And part of the reason was that uh, religion is a very powerful form um, of control, mm. and governments and religion conspire to oppress people. Yeah. Uh, if you combine them, they become too powerful. Well, exact same thing applies to money. I think in 25 years time from now, we're going to begin to see uh, a growing recognition among uh, some countries, mm -hmm. um, pioneering countries, if you like, that there should be separation of money and state in exactly the same way for exactly the same reasons. Yeah. Um, power corrupts, absolute uh, power corrupts, absolutely. Exactly. And yeah. the two most powerful forms of power are money and belief. Yeah. And if you combine the two, <laughs> it's very, very dangerous. It's lethal. So, um, yeah. 
money and state should be separate. Mm -hmm. And in almost all societies where um, power over money is exclusively the domain of the state, uh, then the state very quickly loses respect mm -hmm. uh, for its citizens. In fact, when money is derived from, um, for example, the exploitation of resources, uh, like oil, mm -hmm. with the exception of Norway, <laughs> and I, I, I'm not sure how long that's going to last. Right. Uh, if you look at the history, any government that has the ability to generate money um, outside of taxation, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore is decoupled from the needs, the productivity, the the uh, welfare and labor of yeah. its citizens, especially mm -hmm. the middle class, mm -hmm. very quickly they become irrelevant in the political discussion, right. and the democratic institutions collapse, and you get autocracy. We see that throughout the Middle East, where resource extraction economies, diamonds, cobalt, uh, antimony, mm -hmm. oil, etc., lead to dictatorships and civil wars. Um, it's great that Norway isn't there, but it hasn't been that long since Norway came into sudden wealth Not without much. the need to tax its citizens. Uh, and uh, I don't think that story ends well. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Maybe this is going to be the golden exception. Scandinavia has done that before. But in general, I think the, the combination of state power and power over money is a very dangerous combination. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin technology specifically, not blockchain, but mm -hmm. Bitcoin, mm -hmm. the use of blockchain and currency, um, I think creates enough separation and empowers citizens themselves to control their choice of currency mm -hmm. and to control their ownership of money. Uh, I think that is a powerful counterbalance mm -hmm. to the untethered control over money by governments. We're seeing that already in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing that already in a number of uh, situations where uh, the state has made an extreme mess mm -hmm. of their currency and the people are using Bitcoin defensively. Right. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, they are talking about Fed coins or in Norway it should be Nor coins. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your idea about countries creating their own cryptocurrency that they have control of? Um, well. If they have control of it, it's not a decentralized cryptocurrency. No. It's a centralized database. And that means two things. One, it delivers none of the benefits of liberty that are delivered by a cryptocurrency. Mm. It removes self-determination and empowerment of the individual. Um, it removes censorship resistance. It removes neutrality. It removes mm. the global nature and it's no longer open. So all <laughs> so of the advantages <laughs> of an open public blockchain are gone. Yeah. But what it also does is it adds insecurity. Blockchains are not inherently secure. Mm -hmm. There's nothing magical about a blockchain that no, makes right. it secure. Mm -hmm. It's not the blockchain that makes things secure. It's the decentralization that makes things secure. We cannot secure systems and we cannot secure keys. And when I say we, no one on this planet knows how to secure information perfectly. Mm -hmm. As a result, the only way we have found, and the reason things like the Bitcoin blockchain are secure as a whole, is by spreading the control so thin that there's no one place you can attack to gain any level of control. You have mm -hmm. to attack everywhere. It's the same thing as if, if I wanted to rob every Norwegian of their cash, mm -hmm. I have to go out and hit all of them <laughs> over the head and take their wallet. Right. Yeah. But if they all put it in a vault, mm -hmm. now all I have to do is make a hole in one vault and I get everybody's money. Yeah, right. If you create a Fed coin, then that one blockchain allows you to hack an entire country's monetary <laughs> supply. <laughs> Yep. That is a terrible idea. It's even worse than if we have. If you can them. find a country that can secure that system, um, that would be a miracle because we haven't had one yet. Right. Right. The NSA can't secure their computer systems. North Korea can't secure its computer systems. Even the most autocratic, authoritarian places where every crime is the death penalty yeah can't secure can't systems. Right. And so the only thing we know that can secure systems is to remove concentration of control. 
every one of these Fed coins we're talking about is concentrated control. If they do it, mm -hmm. it will be hacked. Yeah. Why is it not hacked today? Because in most situations, the actual production of money is much more decentralized than people realize. Yes, the interest rate is controlled centrally. Mm -hmm. The printing is done at several different printing places, right. which is then distributed by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of armored trucks on secret routes that constantly change to thousands and thousands of banks where it's introduced into the system. Right. You're talking know. about replacing all of that with a controlled computer system with maybe just a few sets of keys. Right. If right. the government can control it, then anyone who can steal those keys can control it too. Exactly. If yep. the government yep. can't control it and it's decentralized, then what is the point of making it? We already have one of those. It's called Bitcoin. Right, right. <laughs> So it will actually be much worse than we already have today. Absolutely <laughs> much worse. It's much more dangerous than what we have today. Uh, and I think that's unfortunately a lesson that will only be learned the hard way. It doesn't actually remove any of the other problems, which is that inevitably the government is going to manipulate the money supply. And they're going to create inflation in order to erase the debt, because the biggest debt holder in every country is the government itself. Right. Um, and as long as governments are debt holders and not savers, mm -hmm. they will take from savers to pay for their debts. And the best way to do that without taxes, without voting, without anything else mm -hmm. is inflation. Yeah. yeah. It's the best form of theft the government has ever invented. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And very easy. Just print more money. Yes. So uh, another question in this area is what can the general population do to secure themselves from a possible economical collapse? that is predicted by some people in the near future? Oh, well, that's a hard question. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the funny thing is that these two things are connected. If everybody can secure themselves from an economic collapse, an economic collapse doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, an economic collapse, by definition, is something uh, not everyone can protect themselves from. That's why it's a collapse. That's why it's a collapse. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's kind of a circular question, which is, um, you know, one of the things that, that these cryptocurrencies offer is simply an alternative. And it's mm -hmm. because it's an alternative that is based on different fundamentals. It's based on a mathematical monetary supply that doesn't change and is not e easily mm -hmm. inflated or is not inflated at all in the case of Bitcoin. If Because it's a system that cannot easily be co-opted, um, it will operate with different characteristics than traditional currencies, which means that it acts as a safe haven, very much like gold, mm -hmm. silver, uh, precious metals, um, and and some countries' currencies. But um, you know, if everybody tried to buy Bitcoin mm -hmm. to protect themselves from an economic collapse, then Bitcoin would fail too, because of scaling mm -hmm. capacity problems. If it was too early, yeah. Yeah, oh, too, yeah there, there, is no, uh, there is no too early in these kinds of things. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I mean, I hope we don't have a catastrophic uh, collapse, but I do mm -hmm. expect that we will have another global recession, mm -hmm. probably worse than the one we had in 2008, probably right. within the next few years. Yeah, right. It's hard to tell, of course, with these things. Yeah. And without timing, it's a useless prediction because the prediction itself tells you nothing. Of course we will. Uh, business always goes in cycles, there will eventually mm -hmm. be a recession. Um, I think it's going to be more sharp and more broad than the previous one, primarily because mm -hmm. none of the problems that happened during the previous one were fixed, they were just covered up. Right. Um, and, you know, now the world has a lot more debt, so a lot less room to maneuver yeah. if bad things happen in the economy. So I think, yes, Bitcoin can offer a safe haven, but it's very narrow. It can only offer a safe haven for a very, very small percentage of the population who are literate, numerate, mm. internet connected, technologically sophisticated, aware of these systems, and have enough disposable cash to invest a, at least a mm. small enough in into mm. it and do it with the right timing. You know, th that's not going to save anyone. 
really. Or, in fact, if anything, it's going to create a bit of economic inequality because those who mm. have investments in Bitcoin are going to get an enormous bonus in mm. that case. Mm. And, and those who don't, uh, are, are not going to be able to, to get involved because it's going to be too late. Right. Um, you know, I, I do not recommend that people use Bitcoin as their primary investment. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do believe that at this time in, in history, based on the economic conditions we have today, um, people should try to diversify diversify geographically mm -hmm. you know don't have all of your things tied to one national economy right. or one industrial sector mm -hmm. right exactly. um, just like comp comp if, companies do today right mm -hmm. there's I know a lot of workers who um, get their salary from a company and have all of their retirement invested in that company's shares mm -hmm. Um, and all in the currency of their country. I mean, that's a very dangerous combination. Yeah. So yeah. diversify geographically, diversify currencies, don't have a single asset class, have stocks, have bonds, have precious metals, have real estate, have, you know, all of the things. Is, this is standard economic it is. Yeah. Yeah. practice, and I'm not a financial advisor, so I don't know yeah. what I'm talking about. All, <laughs> all I have to say is that Bitcoin represents an asset class. Mm -hmm. It's a novel asset class. It is very volatile, mm -hmm. but it has an element of counter correlation, which means that when everything yeah. is going in one direction, it tends to go mm -hmm. in the opposite direction, which is a useful characteristic for a diversified portfolio if yes. you know how to blend it in the right proportion, which is usually quite small. Mm -hmm. um, but it's worth practicing and learning about this technology um, because it, it might have an impact in, in your ability to weather a storm. Right. Uh, what are the most immediate centralized services that can be decentralized uh, with the help of blockchain? And uh, do you know of, of any such projects going on at the moment, which is not uh, cryptocurrency space? I think the two biggest ones right now are the international wire transfer system, mm -hmm. which is mostly SWIFT. Yeah. Um, so making wire transfers across borders, mm. um, that's an area which is expensive, slow, full of errors, and more importantly, full of geopolitics. <laughs> yes. And so it's a major lever of control that certain governments use to bully other governments. Mm -hmm. uh, and so whether you can send a payment internationally or receive a payment internationally yeah. depends very much on what your government is doing and how well their relationships with other governments are. Right. Um, and that's not a good basis for international commerce. <laughs> um, that can be disrupted. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's already being disrupted simply by the very existence of something like Bitcoin people see the writing on the wall and they're beginning to realize that this level of control that has existed so far mm -hmm. uh, is, a, is going to be short-lived. Mm -hmm. um, the second one is the international remittance market. Uh, again, dominated by one or two major players like Western Union and MoneyGram mm -hmm. um, and companies that transmit $550, $560 billion a year. Yeah. and make $175 billion in fees, which is preposterous, obscene, yeah. Yeah. and ends up costing the poorest people on this planet uh, a lot of money. Right. Now, yeah. when we talk about Bitcoin and helping the other six billion, mm -hmm. you know, the people who are underbanked right. uh, across the board, some people see Bitcoin as it is today and go, ah, with the current fees, you can't possibly do that because no one's going to be able to live on Bitcoin, etc. I think that's a misunderstanding of the argument, which mm -hmm. is at current scale, you can't have everybody living off Bitcoin for day to day transactions across the world. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you're looking at people who live on two dollars a day, that's preposterous. Yeah. But for a person who lives on two dollars a day, they are that means they're getting sixty dollars of income a month. Sixty dollars of income a month is very close to the average remittance sent from immigrants abroad. Mm -hmm. Now think about what a difference it makes if you save that person nine or ten percent. Mm -hmm. uh, and even with the high cost of a Bitcoin transaction, um, 
you can do that cost effectively and competitively with the Western Union, that's the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And think about all of the people who are living on more than $2 a day, but not that much more, mm -hmm. who can greatly benefit from this. All right. So yeah. we can already impact the world's poor, mm -hmm. not by having them use Bitcoin on a daily basis, but simply having them use Bitcoin for one application, and that's remittances. All right. And that's not right. even considering if we use Lightning Network as the remittance channel, which mm -hmm. could then significantly reduce the fees. Right, right. Um, some of the final questions now. Um, uh, more about uh, the Bitcoin community and ecosystem. What can we do to, be, to get a more open and including uh, community uh, where alternative ideas can be discussed in a more scientific and academic manner than we have to do today. We have more uh, uh, shitstorm today, so to say, uh, in, in the discussions with different forums, but how can we help that? How can we do it better? Well, honestly, um, I don't think we can, and I don't know that we necessarily want to. Mm -hmm. Meaning that drama is a symptom. It's a symptom of a system where um, there is no ability for anyone to impose their decision on anybody else. Mm -hmm. Because in the absence of broad agreement, the system simply maintains the status quo. Mm -hmm. It's a system that has a very high threshold for agreement, 90% or more. Mm -hmm for reaching consensus. Right. In such a system, all of the debates will become loud, mm -hmm. will become messy, yeah, as we have and seen. will become angry. Yeah. Um, democracy is messy. If you want clean, mm -hmm. if you want calm, if you want scientific precision, dictatorship <laughs> is how you get it. Right. The trains will mm -hmm. run on time, mm -hmm. the messages will be clean, mm -hmm. there will be very little debate, very little dissent, everybody will have simple answers to complex problems. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that, of course, is that you sacrifice freedom. Right. Yeah. This system is not designed to be clean. And it's not designed to be efficient. All right. In fact, it sacrifices efficiency at a protocol level yeah. for liberty. Mm -hmm. And we've got to understand that it also sacrifices decorum and clean debates and all of the other nice things that happen when when you can elect one person to make the decision and instead what you have is this very messy process which is very organic mm -hmm. and very free-flowing because mm -hmm. it involves a lot of exchange of opinion mm -hmm. all of that noise though is irrelevant watch what's happened over the last three years all of this noise mm -hmm. bitcoin still works mm -hmm. For about a dollar, you can send an international payment that is completely uncensorable mm -hmm. and near instantaneous, will be confirmed within 10 minutes, mm -hmm. cleared completely, mm -hmm. and be irreversible after it was already uncensorable. Anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. to anyone, without even showing a lick of ID. That system still works beautifully, despite the fact that there are some multi-multi-millionaires who want to change it, some other multi-millionaires who don't want to change it, with enormous budgets and mm -hmm. shouting and campaigns and sock puppets. And right. the yeah. fact that these people can't change it, despite of how powerful they appear, big mining consortia, mm -hmm. large groups of developers, mm -hmm. all of them unable to impose their opinion and it still works. That is the essence of the system. All of this noise, nothing changes. Until we need to change and we have sufficient agreement among everybody. And guess what? If we don't change a thing, Bitcoin still works exactly as it is. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to see a system where we can get together in a consortium or a governance committee, or elect representatives, or have a meeting. We can't have a meeting. There are six million people yeah. involved in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. The only meeting that happens mm -hmm. is every 10 minutes, a block is propagated, 
and every node on the network validates it according to the consensus rules. That is our governance model. All of the rest is just noise surrounding it. We don't need another governance model. That one works fine. And the reason it works is because it resists attacks and coercion in an adversarial environment. We're not even in a very adversarial environment anymore yet. yet. But we will get into an adversarial yeah. environment. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have some very big adversaries. If we can't handle a bit of drama on Reddit, imagine what happens when entire governments yeah. are attacking this system, mm -hmm. which they will, as Probably, some yes. of them have started to do. Probably, yeah. We need to be able to resist that. And resisting that will be very noisy and very dramatic. And hopefully, in the end, Bitcoin will continue to work exactly as it does today. It's going to be very difficult to replicate that across the board, but mm -hmm. it's one of the reasons why in the scaling debate, for example, there are easy answers. And those easy answers are answers that require us to sacrifice the very things that allow us to resist a takeover, that allow us to resist mm -hmm. co-option and corruption of the principles of the system. Right. With that, uh, I would like to conclude and uh, say uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to Norway. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.